All right, uh, for the sake of time, um, and I don't want to keep you too long from lunch break afterwards, I can already predict that I might take a few minutes of your lunch break, at least for the Q&A part. Uh, um, so feel free to stay along. Uh, we're going to finish pretty much on time, but if for Q&A, I am available even into lunch break. All right, um, welcome to uh, the, this first of my, my two spring sessions uh, at TopConf Tallinn here. I uh, am starting today in this track with a state-of-the-art review of the, uh, well, certain aspects, certain characteristics of the spring component model, in particular with a connection to recent Java language developments in, um, in the Spring Framework 4 generation. So this is a state-of-the-art talk basically against the state-of-the-art in Spring Framework 4.3 uh, as we find it right now, basically a 2016 talk. My talk tomorrow is about uh, Spring Framework 5, 5.0, 5.1, uh, the central themes in there, JDK 9, HTTP 2, and in particular reactive architectures. That's tomorrow in the reactive architecture track, same time, 12 o'clock again. All right, so this talk today um, is a source code centric talk. Beware, basically. It's not a traditional uh, um, uh, slide talk and it's not a live demo either, in particular, since what we're going to do is a design review. So we're going to look at source code snippets and going to reason about why they are the way they are. I'm going to explain uh, a little bit about the motivation behind Spring's component model design, and I'm going to highlight a few recent refinements in the component model that you might not have seen yet, might not be aware of, and might uh, wonder about uh, the, the when and how to use those things. So let me check up front. Uh, who is a actively using Spring here? All right, perfect. Uh, inverse question, who's not an active Spring user at this point? That's all right, you're going to find your way into this, I hope, even with those 40 minutes. Um, who hasn't actually seen any Spring at all before ever, like touched or looked at it? Is there somebody completely unaware of what Spring is doing? You might even, even then you might be able to follow, but uh, the mix looks perfect here. All right, uh, so just uh, a couple of seconds on myself. I've been in charge of the Spring Framework Open Source project uh, for a long time now. I'm uh, the uh, open source project lead of everything on GitHub on Spring-Framework, so the entire core framework. Um, I've been doing this since its inception. I've co-founded the project and I've been surfing in that same role ever since. Uh, so I've been actively uh, engaged in the decision making behind some of those component model refinements behind the evolution of the framework as well. So uh, uh, I have a sort of inside perspective into the design for sure. I am going to take a little bit of a usage perspective in this presentation as well, since fundamentally the component model is only as uh, good as it is actually usable for application development. That's its purpose after all. All right, let's start at the very bottom, uh, just briefly to bring us onto the same page and to already start explaining a little bit of the storyline behind the component model. The, at the heart of what uh, modern day Spring is doing, and we're focusing on the annotation-based model here. Um, so th this is kind of the state of the art of recent years for sure. So the, in the annotation-based component model in Spring, it is fundamentally about taking a Java class of yours. So in the end, we start exactly where you start. Uh, in an IDE, you start creating a regular Java class. A class which has a role in your code base, in your architecture. Here it's named my book admin service. It suggests implementing a service interface of yours. It does regular Java things like declaring, uh, well, public uh, service methods here. Uh, and it uses a constructor, in this case for dependency injection purposes. Um, that these days, this is basically a, just a recipe for a class following the dependency inj injection pattern. Annotations now come in um, as descriptive elements. So from a, from a very fundamental perspective, 
we're still at the source code level here, right? Um, we annotate certain elements of our source code with additional formal metadata telling us something about that piece of source code, right? So the, uh, this class itself is formally annotated as an add service, kind of formally declaring itself to have the role of a service class in your architecture. A little bit like the good old UML stereotyping model, just as a, as a formal language element um, designed as an annotation. Uh, there are, can be further characteristics assigned, like uh, lazy, primary, qualifier elements. Um, but for this, just for the point here, uh, it is basically just a class with formal uh, characteristics attached to it at the class level through, uh, in, through a couple of annotations, in particular through a stereotype. Now, for the service method here, there is this transactional annotation here. And just, it's just hinting at the readability of things, right? Um, this update book method is transactional, right? Transactional. It is descriptive even in the choice of name of the annotation. It doesn't say transaction attribute or uh, just transaction or something. It's not associating a hard uh, noun or in, in some form a metadata element per se. It is designed as a descriptive element. We pay a lot of attention to the naming of our annotations in particular. Consistent naming and descriptive naming in the sense of those annotations uh, supporting the readability of the, uh, the uh, signature that they are annotating. So like, the same works for the uh, uh, class level as well, of course. Right? The, my book admin service is a lazy service class. Right? You can read it through the annotations. You have to jump around a little maybe in the order, but uh, in the end, it's about readable, self-describing source code. The constructor, uh, accepting a reference to some other object that you're interacting with, that's of course core dependency injection, uh, a core dependency injection arrangement, the core domain of Spring. There's already a little sneaky element here. There's at auto-wired, which is the uh, common Spring auto-wiring annotation, that you can apply to constructors fields or um, uh, also to, to configuration methods. At the constructor level, very commonly used, of course. Um, again, descriptive, you know, auto wired. This constructor is auto wired. It's not an instruction. It's not at inject, like inject this, right? Which is basically an instruction. It's a description. This constructor is designed for auto wiring or is, is, is auto-wired, is to be auto-wired, you can read it any way you please. But there's another little, another little, little sneaky element here, it's actually commented out. Yeah. So why is that? I'm using this in, uh, in this presentation for the purposes of this presentation. Whenever you find a commented out annotation, we recommend adding it for the descriptiveness of the source code, for the self-descriptiveness of the source code, but it's not actually required. Since as of Spring 4.3, if we encounter, even in the annotated model, if we encounter a class with a single constructor which is obviously designed for dependency injection purposes, we are going to take that constructor anyway. We're not going to tell you, you didn't provide a constructor and there's no default constructor either. A kind of annotate one, please. We're not going to tell you that anymore. We're, we're more lenient now based on common requests. So this auto-wide annotation is actually optional as of Spring 4.3. But we nevertheless, for readability, we suggest adding it, in particular in this context. If you have an annotated class anyway with a stereotype and maybe with uh, method level annotations, it's generally a good idea to explicitly annotate your injection points as well. Um, but there may be many classes in your code base that are simple delegates. Maybe they don't have a specific role. They are not transactional boundaries. They are not endpoints either. They live within somewhere within your processing architecture. They do use dependency injection to be connected to other pieces of your uh, arrangement, but they have no other annotations maybe in, in the source code. And that's when it really pays off to uh, just uh, not annotate the constructor either. If there are no annotations in your, in your Java class otherwise, it's maybe a good idea to just design an injection, uh, a constructor for injection purposes. Don't annotate it, let the framework figure out um, that it's supposed to use it 
Right. Annotations, now, as a selected deep dive, right? Uh, annotations are composable. This is a little bit on the advanced end. Uh, I've, I've not seen too many code bases actively uh, using uh, self-composed annotations. Although it's entirely doable and actually recommended for larger code bases, we use it ourselves as well. So it's also a, a intended to support your understanding of some of the annotations that come with the framework or, or some of the other uh, uh, sister projects like Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. Some of the annotations, these, uh, or many of the annotations coming there are actually designed like this. They are custom annotations in the end, like this my service stereotype annotation, instead of using Spring's provided service annotation out of the box, you could craft your own one, like my service. Of course, this is just a custom annotation. In uh, the Java language, there's nothing special about annotations. They are just regular Java types. Um, drop them into your code. It's an add interface. Compile it, and you've got an annotation type in your code base. The, uh, don't forget runtime retention. It's a uh, Typical mistake number one, uh, add runtime retention, because if you want the framework to see them at runtime, they need to be uh, retained at runtime for a start. The other annotations on top are what we call meta annotations. They are actually part of uh, the, the characteristic, uh, characteristic arrangement here. A my service has all the characteristics of a standard add service. It changes the default scope to session, it has a default primary role, and it even has a default transactional characteristic for all public service methods on this class. So my service, this custom annotation that's sketched here, actually combines the characteristics above into one custom annotation. And every time you're using the custom annotation, like my service here, you're actually expressing the combination of characteristics above. So in that sense, it's a shortcutting model. But I wouldn't look at it as a shortcutting model from, from uh, uh, its, its uh, primary purpose. Its primary purpose is actually serving as a custom stereotype. Give it, give it a proper name, right? Uh, name it account service, order service. Name it after some vertical or some horizontal slice in your code base, in your architecture. A name that has a meaning in your architecture. Then it can say like uh, account service or, or order service, kind of indicating which part um, of the architecture it belongs to. There may be any number of classes, of course, annotated with the same annotation, nevertheless. And this kind of service that you're declaring here implies the characteristics above. That's the way I prefer to look at it, right? It is kind of a shortcutting model, but ideally attached to a special kind of role that a class has within your code base with all the characteristics implied. Composable annotations can even have attributes. That's a more recent development. Annotations have been composable in Springland for a bit. Uh, some of this has been refined only very lately, only really completed in Folder 3. Um, so if you design custom annotations for a more specific purpose, not a general stereotype, but maybe just a scoping annotation, just a custom annotation expressing a certain bean scope. So again, uh, following my rather simple naming arrangement, named my session scoped, please use a better name if you do any of this in practice, but um, the my prefix is just nice for my purposes here. So my session scoped is meta annotated with the spring scope annotation. It hard codes the session string. So you get rid of the freely choosable scope names. You have the scope name as part of the annotation, which is nice from a type safety perspective. And it chooses to also expose a mode attribute. Now, if an annotation has an attribute, uh, there needs to be some meaning behind that attribute, right? This uh, attribute is linked with an alias for annotation to Spring's scope annotation, kind of overriding or pointing to the proxy mode attribute there. So you're actually taking an attribute that comes from one of the meta annotations, you're kind of exposing it here. As you can see here, the name may even be different. So the name is shortened to mode here. The original scope annotation has a proxy mode attribute. Um, you, there's a couple of, there's a bit of extra flexibility. You may kind of narrow in an array attribute to a single element and a few other things. 
Um, you may also simply retain the name, that you, then you don't need to specify the name here, because if the name's the same anyway, we detect it anyway. The alias, this alias for, is primarily there for self-descriptiveness. If somebody looks at, at this kind of annotation declaration in your code, reviews kind of the code here and, and bumps into this, it becomes pretty obvious what this annotation does. If you know the general idea that it's composable for a start, you, you can look at this and you are immediately pointed to the original attribute that we are re-exposing here. So that's custom scoping annotations. Those are to be found across quite a, uh, a few of the Spring projects. Um, Spring Cloud, for example, has uh, custom scoping annotations. Spring Batch has some. There's a refresh scope, there's a step scope, a chop scope. Um, they are all built along those lines. Many, custom an many annotations around the Spring portfolio itself in other Spring projects are actually just composed annotations designed like this. And as of 4.3, we even ship uh, web scoping annotations out of the box based on common request, like a request scope, session scope, application scope annotation, basically designed like this. An additional feature is that attributes can declare defaults. That's actually quite a nice design element. You can change the default. My session scoped can use a scoped proxy mode target class by default without you having to repeat that declaration every time. So a custom annotation with attributes can also choose to use it different defaults from the spring annotations. A nice variation down here is uh, this custom transaction annotation. So uh, it's a my transactional one, meta annotated with add transactional. So far, so straightforward. You could, of course, choose a different name. You could call it TX if you wanted to shorten it, or read only TX and hard code that part, whatever, right? Your choice, basically, instead of Spring's add transactional. But now, what happens to the attributes here? This a little sketch chooses to re-expose only one attribute out of many. The original Spring Add Transactional annotation has plenty of attributes. It has a propagation behavior, uh, rollback rules, uh, transaction-specific isolation level, transaction-specific timeout, uh, transaction name even. Um, there are plenty of attributes on Add Transactional. Now, in uh, this particular example, we the designer of this custom annotation chose to only re-expose one specific attribute. As a matter of guidance, we're kind of trying to guide a development team um, for a particular project maybe towards ignoring all the other attributes, don't care about the rest, focus on this particular one. And in this case, it's the read-only attribute. Read-only. Um, is a particularly important characteristic of a transactional because it really allows for significant runtime optimizations. The framework can basically infer a lot of optimizations from a read-only declaration at this level. But there's another twist. The read-only attribute does not declare a default. In the Java language, in uh, the Java annotation model, this means that any user of at my transactional is forced to say read only equals true or read only equals false. They cannot get away without reasoning about the read only nature of this scope. Again, a matter of guidance. You're kind of forcing every user of this custom annotation in maybe a particular project to explicitly say read only true or false. It's too easy to forget about it, right? The default is false, of course. You cannot make read only assumptions if you don't know any better. Um, but that means you, the framework cannot do runtime optimizations against it. So as a matter of guidance, think about the defaults. If you're building custom annotations, choose your defaults wisely. Guide your development team the right way through the choice of attributes, through the choice of defaults. All right. Another central element of the component model, and I'm sure you've seen it in many variants, configuration classes. Configuration classes, heavily used in Spring Boot, of course, and in many other projects, Spring Cloud as well in particular, uh, they serve as a way to add additional bean definitions to the container through uh, this notion of annotated factory methods. So essentially, a configuration class is, a r is itself a regular Spring component class. It's a Java class with a stereotype on top, add configuration, 
like at service, like at repository, at controller, just at configuration here. The special characteristic of at configuration classes is it may have any number of at bin methods. And at bin methods are factory methods where the container introspects the signature and derives a bin definition, what the container calls a bin definition in Springland, from it. So this bin is called my book admin service following the method name. It has a suggested type, book admin service, that we can use for some early type matching. Without having to create the bean, we know what the, type, the matchable type of the bean will be. There may be additional metadata here. You could add uh, lazy annotations or qualifiers or whatever at the method level. And such methods, factory methods, may even refer to each other. What looks like an innocent uh, method call here is actually a symbolic reference because we're going to intercept it at runtime. Um, it means give me the currently managed instance of this book admin data service bean that I'm referring to here. So we're not straightforwardly calling that method. We're going back to the container, back into the factory method based on the container state management. If there's already an existing instance for a singleton scoped bean, you're going to get the existing instance. The container is only going to call the factory method if a new instance is in demand. So generally, those are, look, those are not lookup methods, they are factory methods. The container only calls them whenever a new instance of this particular bean is to be created. For a session scoped bean, the first time such a bean is actually requested in a new session. For a single scoped bean that maybe only once on startup, or once the first time it's used in case of a lazy singleton. So that's the basic arrangement. A few twists here. Configuration classes, in particular in Spring Boot land or in a modern Spring Boot style application, also serve uh, as the primary way of uh, adding some conditional, some conditions to your configuration. So the add profile above is, is, a, is a simple example of a condition. Only activate the beans on this configuration class, actually the configuration class itself, including all its beans, if the profile standalone is marked as active on startup. But this is a, a general model. There's a, also a conditional annotation with a condition implementation that you can assign. This is what Spring Boot is based on. Conditional on the presence of a class in the class path, the non-presence of a class in the class path, the presence of a certain bean of a type in the application context definition, the non-presence of a bean of a certain type, in which case Boot will add a default bean maybe of that type. So Boot's auto Spring Boot's auto-configuration flexibility is built on the configuration class model and conditions. Profile here is a simple condition. Boot has very fancy conditions based on the same model. And of course, add enable annotations also found in Boot are basically the equivalent of the good old XML namespaces. They opt into certain default container behavior. So add enable transaction management will take a uh, a platform transaction management being from the context based on, on some rules and activate and tra add transactional behavior that way. In Spring's design, such behavior is opt-in because by not declaring such an add-enable annotation, we are simply going to not do anything special at runtime. From our perspective, annotations are metadata elements. You need to be able to ignore metadata elements if you choose to do so, for example, in testing scenarios. So you can basically reduce at transactional annotations to just metadata that are just there in your source code and the framework doesn't do anything about them by not declaring at enable transaction management. But if you do, there is some default behavior, some default reaction uh, to the transaction annotation coming from the framework itself, doing its interception of the methods and beginning and committing and rolling back of transactions that way. So that's the basic design idea. Another little twist. Add bean methods actually work on non-configuration classes, but you won't get this behavior. This book admin data source cross-reference thing suggested here um, only works through special subclassing. We're creating a CGLib subclass of a configuration class here. We intercept, we overwrite those methods in, able, in order to intercept such calls. Uh, add configuration classes imply this CGLib subclassing. If you put add bean methods on regular add component classes or anything else, they're still going to be detected as factory methods, but they are not going to get this overriding behavior. So just as a side note, it's also an easy way to work around uh, CGLib issues if you don't want the CGLib subclassing because you're not using 
at being cross-reference calls anyway. All right, a uh, slightly different perspective again. Let's focus on injection points. Um, and let's start with uh, configuration classes with an injection point. Like how, do you, how could you possibly get uh, access uh, to, to uh, other objects from a configuration class? It's actually simple. It's a regular spring managed component type, right? Add configuration is just a special kind of component in, in Springland. It, uh, it is a managed instance, it has state, so just declare a uh, field, like uh, the data source being here, give it a constructor, let the constructor accept the reference like you would do in a regular component, store it in the field, and in the addbin method, refer to the field, right? Configuration classes are essentially regular component classes, just with the special purpose of holding addbin methods. All the rest can still be applied. Field injection, as of for the three, I admit, <laughs> this works as well. Previously, you couldn't actually use custom constructors on configuration classes. As of for the three, you can. And based on the same reasoning that we outlined initially, auto wide is actually optional here because if it's the only constructor and it looks like a dependency injection constructor, we're going to use it anyway. So injection points like this actually work on configuration classes and you can just use the outcome uh, for example, in your factory methods. Another way of going about this, like reusing some configuration and doing kind of cross-referencing between parts of your configuration, since configuration classes are regular Java classes, you can uh, use inheritance. Don't be afraid of using inheritance, right? Uh, my application config up there extends a base configuration class. This is only a, an, this is an incomplete sketch, right? Admittedly, there would have to be an abstract method here or a concrete method for this one. Um, so, in such an arrangement, the behavior is just what you would expect it to be. Just like Java inheritance in any other class hierarchy, we detect addbin methods on all inheritance levels. Of course, addbin methods can override each other. A subclass can choose to substitute one or more of the admin methods. If some of them are abstract in the base class, uh, the, and the, of course the base class itself is abstract then, then the subclass is forced to substitute certain admin methods. We call this configuration fragments. You can ship a certain library or a certain part of your code base, can ship configuration fragments, base classes basically, for other parts of, the, uh, of your code base to uh, create subclasses from it and substitute specific beans. Makes a lot of sense in particular in a microservice architecture in any kind of architecture where you're reusing similarly structured configuration across different deployment units. So basically make use of the, Java, the core Java language feature that is inheritance and abstract methods in configuration scenarios. It works as, ex as you would expect it to. We're even taking it one level further, what if you <laughs> let a configuration class implement an interface and the interface uses default methods, Java 8 default methods? Now, this is a little bit out of the ordinary, but in the end, it's a Java 8 language feature, a standard Java language feature these days. And in Springland, we align with Java language features as, as much as we can and try to stay unopinionated about whether you should be doing this. But since the Java language allows you in, to declare default methods and uh, kind of like inheritance a little bit, have those methods appearing in your class hierarchy, it, unless they are overridden, of course. You know, where a standard default method behavior is, there's a default method without access to state here in the interface, and the, uh, my application config will have a variant of this method out of the box, but it can, of course, choose to override it according to Java 8, to standard Java 8 default method rules. So we're not bending the rules here. We are just detecting at bean annotations and the, the other, the uh, uh, rest of the metadata on default methods in interfaces as well. We explicitly needed to do this because default method handling at runtime is a little bit a little bit strange, but in order to provide the experience that you would expect from a user perspective, like if you did this, you want, clearly want these methods to be, detected, to be detected like if they were in the, in the inheritance hierarchy. And we're doing exactly that for you. 
In practice, this is actually quite nice for fragments as well, for configuration fragments. You can implement several interfaces even. As long as all of those interfaces kind of uh, don't have conflicting signatures, but as long as uh, you design it the right way, you're going to have a form of uh, multiple inheritance here where all of those admin methods combined appear in your my application config class. This is particularly nice if you want a central class composed from several fragments. You need to have the corresponding configuration scenario first. So only consider this if you have a scenario that actually benefits from it. I, I definitely recommend traditional inheritance over default methods if it's sufficient for your purposes. But if you know, inheritance is just not flexible enough, this is actually a quite nice way of doing it. There may even be cross-references here, like uh, uh, default methods can refer to regular abstract methods in the interface. Um, uh, there's some nice design power in this. All right. Now, again, back to injection points, um, a, a little bit more detailed on the injection point itself, so on the, on the type declaration of the injection point. Now, let's assume some configuration class or several classes have those two admin methods above, right? My account repository and my product repository in some configuration classes somewhere in your code base, registered in the application context. Now, an, another class declares an injection point here of my repository of account. What would you expect to happen? Um, well, we make a match, we look at the type signature and we say, all right, my repository of account is only one bean matching the full generic type declaration, including this substituted type variable. So we're clearly going to take this one, right? Works as of Spring Framework 4.0. In 3.2, it would actually have complained about more than one my repository being to be in the context here. And you would uh, add a qualifier back then. But here, there is no need for a qualifier. I would even argue, uh, qualifiers are a, a, a bonus feature, a niche feature. Uh, you would only use them if the type itself cannot be made expressive enough. So as long as your generic type declaration is expressive enough to make a unique match, there's no extra metadata needed, even if there are several um, beans of the primary type here. You could even introduce a type variable just for this purpose, just for a clearer match, because this adds to the readability of your code as well, right? It's, it, makes, it helps you to read, to make the, uh, the, uh, uh, the assignment in, in your head just as much as it helps the framework itself to make the match at runtime. Um, so this, is, this works, of course, for any generic type structure to any, any, any level deep. Uh, it also works based on an assignment. I've already hinted at It's about assignability. It's not a, a, a key, right? It's not like... It doesn't have to be identical, it has to be assignable. So if this method above says, I return a my repository impl of account, or an account repository impl class that happens to say implement my repository of account in its own class declaration, that's all sufficient because we can detect the generic type information in those signatures at runtime, and we can make the match. We can make an assignability check against this declaration. As long as it's assignable, we're still going to make a unique match, just like the Java compiler would do it, right? If you could write my repository account repo equals this, uh, uh, a type, uh, an instance of this other signature, if the compiler lets you do it, we make it uh, an assignability match at runtime. We follow the Java compiler rules here. A couple of nice variations before we um, come to the uh, to the bonus part of the presentation where we talk about the endpoint design for a few minutes. Um, if you're trying something like this, it just, it just, it just works. So uh, try a collection, like a list of my repository of account. What would you expect to happen in, tradition, in traditional spring structures? You would expect to get a collection of all beans that are of my repository of account. So we're going to look for all beans that are assignable to this type. We're going to build a list for you. If there are add order hints in the bean declarations, we're even going to take those into account, sort the list for you, and pass it in. If you were trying this in a different scenario, where there's, say there's a target bean that provides a list of account, and you're simply saying, I want a list of account here, 
that's going to work as well. So we're going to evaluate lists or collections in general both ways, as of folder 3. We're going to consistently evaluate them both ways. This can mean a list of some target bean type, or it can mean a bean of that list type. Because in particular in an add bean world, it's easy enough to say, I'm returning a list of a particular type. Please make sure that the return type declaration of your add bean methods is expressive enough. So uh, we can only do this if we know that it's a list of account. If it just says a list without a list question mark or a list uh, uh, un untyped, uh, we cannot make the match, right? Make, generally, make sure that your add bean return types are as specific as you can, or at least as specific as you need them to be for a unique type match. But it's, in the end, it's about intuitiveness. It should just work the way, it, uh, the way you think it does based on uh, your reading of the source code. Another uh, little twist to wrap this up is the uh, declaration of head lazy, also a recent feature in the photo dex line. Consider declaring your injection points at add lazy, or at least some of them. Um, this can be, in particular for constructor injection, a very um, straightforward thing to do, because lazy basically says, give me a my repository of account reference, but I'm not going to use it right now. I'm just going to store it in some field, going to use it later on. I don't insist on a fully initialized bean of the type right here, because I'm not going to call it in the constructor yet. This is usually appropriate in many constructor injection scenarios in particular. That's exactly what you mean. But by not declaring at lazy, you're kind of semantically forcing the container to give you a fully initialized bean here. In a circular reference scenario, you know, like if both ends of an A-B cycle insist on getting a fully initialized other at the constructor level, you've got an unresol uh, unresolvable circular reference. With add lazy, circular reference problems largely disappear. If at least one end of the cycle does not insist, insist on getting a fully initialized other, the cycle is cleanly resolvable. That said, I generally recommend against circular references. If you can design your components without circular references, all the better, right? But sometimes you'll find yourselves in a sort of unavoidable scenario. So that's add lazy at the injection point level with this specific meaning. You're basically getting a proxy, and only when you call a method on the proxy, then we're going to resolve the actual target bean in the context. Makes in particular a lot of sense if the target declaration is also a lazy in its singleton. Lazy can have two meanings. Lazy at the declaration point means only instantiated if really uh, once, once actually needed, right? Don't instantiate it eagerly on startup. In, uh, instantiate it, create the bean once it's actually needed. Goes very nicely together. Makes a lot of sense to use at lazy at both ends. Uh, don't necessarily have to do it, right? Depending on the semantics that you actually want. All right. So uh, coming to the end, uh, just a few a few examples to uh, show you one more point, if you can bear with me. The uh, this is Spring MVC, of course, and we're not going to talk about Spring MVC itself. But there's a little for the free refinement coming here. This, this is Spring MVC, regular Spring uh, component type, instance state, Ottawa constructors, as you would expect. Add controller as a special stereotype, and I like add service, add repository. So uh, essentially a Spring Bench bean with the special role of having request mapping methods. So like configuration classes with add bean methods, we have controller classes with request mapping methods. If you're running in a Spring Dispatcher, right? In the spring uh, WebMVC dispatcher servlet in this case. Uh, when a, an, a, a matching HTTP request comes in, we dispatch to the corresponding endpoint method. We resolve its flexible parameter signature where you can refer to certain elements of the incoming request. Uh, and your method can then do whatever it needs and have a flexible return type that can be turned into a response body. Uh, can suggest a response status, whatever. There's a lot of flexibility in this. Now, this is the traditional arrangement. Now, look what we did in folder 3. In folder 3, we provide pre-composed annotations called get mapping, post mapping. Uh, we also have, of course, delete mapping and put mapping and patch mapping. So for the common interaction types in RESTland, uh, we have pre-composed annotations now. They are literally 
composed annotations as, as we've discussed before. You could design them yourselves, right? You could, they're just get mapping, meta annotated with add request mapping, a couple of attributes all with Elias for annotations. We don't uh, specifically support them in Spring MVC. We support them implicitly through the annotation composition model. Now, this is another twist in, in that design. Just look at the difference here. This is the same mapping, right? With request mapping, it's all about attributes. You have to do the method as an attribute and the path as an attribute. Almost always, at least two attributes, right? And in the Java annotation model, in the Java language, that means you have to name the attributes. There's one special feature in Java annotations. You can get away without naming the attribute if there is a single attribute specified and if, there is a single, if there's an attribute named value on the declaration type. We do that in get mapping and post mapping since the HTTP method is part of the name implied by the annotation type itself. You can often get away with just specifying the path, which means you can skip the attribute name. That's why it's so short, right? It's a specific design principle applied here, um, implying certain characteristics in the annotation type, leaving only a single attribute to be specified by the user. All right, so that's basically, uh, we, we are at the end of the time. I uh, sympathize with it. Um, this is actually the last uh, example here. Just to give you the design principle in something you haven't seen it yet, if you're doing stomp message processing on a WebSocket channel, something very different from traditional serverlet MVC interaction, you're going to design controller endpoints like this. Look at the analogy here. Right? The, this is Spring MVC with Spring MVC controllers, HTTP requests mapped. This is modeling something quite different, but it's stylistically analogous. It's a Spring Mesh controller type, a controller bean, and it has handler methods, flexible signatures, and mapping annotations. In this case, mapping the two uh, kinds of stomp messages, like a regular payload message or a subscribe request, both of them having a specific mapping annotation. Compare this to get mapping, post mapping, the single attribute specified. There's a lot of design consistency, consistency in Spring's endpoint models, so not just in Spring MVC land, but also in Spring's messaging endpoints. This is out of the box in Spring framework itself, by the way. This is uh, part of Spring Framework itself as of Spring Framework 4. Um, but that same design consistency applies to other endpoint types in Spring integration in other Spring portfolio projects. All right. So much for this little tour. Um, this is literally against the state of the art, so taking everything into account that we have right now. We're currently at 434. Uh, in parallel, we're working on Spring Framework 5, which is what I'm going to talk about tomorrow against the milestone phase that's not released yet. Right? We can talk about what we released in 5.0 milestone 3 tomorrow. But this is basically what we have here. Uh, I hope there's been some interesting bits in this for each and every one of you. If there are further questions, I'm of course happy to take them. Um, otherwise, enjoy your lunch break. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>